and sandals, that sort of thing. So I'm sort of doing my own version of what a dad would wear. Uh, well, as a dad that I am, I'm a Harley guy. So, um, I, you know, Father's Day is a it's a thing. Uh, talking about fathers, um, I suppose that I would say I I blame <laughs> dads for a lot of the trouble we're in. Ouch. Um, and I mean bad dads. Uh, I. I tend to think, you know, when I look at a lot of what's going on in society these days, I think that maybe one of the, the big problems that we've had is a lack of proper male role modeling. And, uh, you know, we see how there's so much pressure now, or not pressure, pressure isn't the right word, but I guess there is pressure on on men from the mainstream media and things like that to be less masculine and um, less authoritarian or, or that sort of thing because they, they, they see some of the, you know, the abuses that we've had. Um, you know, I was talking to my son and one of them and uh, we were talking about, yeah, controlling our temper and things like that and some of the troubles that we have as men, and you know, you, you realize that there have been lots of abuses, that there have been... <sighs> okay, I'm married to Janine, so you'll have to forgive my um, um, example, but who here has seen The Little Mermaid? Okay. So, let do, do not remember... King Triton's rant, um, temper tantrum, maybe, when he smashes all of, all of Ariel's stuff, including her statue of Prince Eric. Is that right, Prince Eric? Yeah. I mean, that was not a good thing, right? He, he, he kind of went too crazy, and then and, and there's crying Ariel, and, and he's realizing he didn't do things right. We... We have some bad examples of dads, and sometimes we are the bad examples of dads. Um, and I think one of the questions that's happening right now that's coming about maybe being answered and sometimes answered in the wrong way is, what is a man? What is a proper man? Because there's, you know, when I, when I think about what is a dad, the first thing that, I, that comes to my mind is a, a man. Maybe I'm already controversial, Dennis, for saying that a father is a man, but I'm going to stand by that. Um, and so a good father probably has to be a good man. So what, is, what makes a good man? Jenny and I have talked about lots of different things. We, we went um, on a Disney cruise one time, thankfully, because her, her parents paid for it, because, you know. <sighs> and we really, we, we, we really enjoyed it. And one of the things I noticed, and I was, I was telling Janine while we were there, I said, you know, first of all, there's not that many males that work as characters or just any of the time working with the kids, and the ones that are what I'd call effeminate. And she stepped up and, you know, she said, well, I think that makes sense because, you know, that way they're not threatening to the kids and things like that. And I thought, huh. Is there a, is there a way that we can be masculine men, masculine fathers, but not at the same time scare our kids? Good question. I'm not sure I can answer it. I hope there is. We've had lots of conversations about how I do things as, as a dad. And, you know, it's always a, it's kind of a give and take between loving and nurturing and holding the line and saying, this you can't cross. That, that play between justice and mercy. So it really is sort of uh, 
cliche or obvious, but also true, that it's a good idea to go to Scripture to find out what makes a good father. And there's lots of things that I can think about in Scripture about how God is as a father. Um, and I certainly cannot go into all of them. So I, I tried to choose just a, a couple that would give you an idea that we could talk about. So the first one is Hosea. It's going to take me a bit to find this one. Ah, okay. Like, I'm sure it's in there. But now that I'm eating it, I probably can't hear it. Um, Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt, and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart has changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows, from Assyria, fluttering like doves. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. There's a lot of images here that I I want to point out. Um, We often think of moms as the one that are doing the playing, the bending down, the feeding, and, and things like that. But yet I remember Janine and I talking, and I, I remember being in a Zeller's. Are there even Zeller's anymore? Yeah, so that was a while ago, <laughs> back before I had kids. Um, and I remember there was this, uh, we were in the toy section, right? And there was this, uh, this little girl came running around the corner, and all of a sudden the dad comes running around like this. After he, he sees me, and he's just like, you know, sudden, suddenly he was, he was all embarrassed, but I was like, I told you, and I said, that's the dad I want to be. Not the embarrassed part, but the one that's going to be out playing with their, with their child, right? And there's, there's images like this of the dad. You know, it was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. I led them with tie, accords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek. That sounds motherly but it's Father as well. And I bent down to feed them. There's there's also this this part where, you know, he says, look, they're constantly fighting me. They're determined to turn away from me. That's that other part of the, the Father that, you know, the Father quite often is what we hear in maybe some of the old TV shows, just wait till your father gets home. Because it was expected that that was going to be, well, now you're going to get a whipping. We can't do that anymore. But the father was considered to be the authoritarian. He was the one that doled out the punishment. And um, 
Obviously, there's exceptions, and there's uh, plenty of times where that's not the case, but that was generally thought to be the, the case. And here we see this, where, where God the Father is saying, you guys are so rebellious, I'm going to have to punish you. But then he goes back and says, but how can I do that? You're my children. My compassion doesn't want to let me punish you. I love you. And so there's these two competing things that are in a father's heart. They recognize that I've got to lead my children in a particular way, and sometimes that means I'm going to have to do not so much leading with cords of human kindness and ties of love, but more with at least a verbal strap. And then there's the other side that says, you screwed up, and the first thing that comes to my mind is that I want to yell at you or I want to punish you, but at the same time I recognize that you screwed up because you're young and you don't know and you need the love more than you need the tongue lashing. Both of those things are in God. There are so many other things. I I looked at, um, you know, where there are if you look back in, in, in uh, Samuel, in the book of Samuel, you'll see that uh, the prophet, or the, the priest Eli, gets in trouble with God because his children, his two sons, were blaspheming God and he didn't do enough to stop them. And he was punished for it. So we're held to account of what our children do. You see in the qualifications for deacons and elders that their children are believers because if they can't manage their household, how can they manage God's household? So there's this kind of sense of responsibility that says you need to lead your children, you need to lead your family in ways that are godly, and that there's that responsibility there. But then there's also things that explain how sometimes you'll have a godly father and the children go south or vice versa. I've labored over many of my decisions that I've made as, as a father. <laughs> many I probably should have labored over more, but, you know, and I thought about, well, how will this affect my kids? Even just like having the motorcycles, I, I recognize that they're dangerous. And I don't want my children to take that danger on. And I wonder, do I try and dissuade them from it, or do I teach them the safe way of doing it. And then sometimes I realize that they're going to do what they're going to do. But turn back to to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel. Yes. I start at verse 11. I, I should look this up. I'm sorry. Yeah. First Samuel 8, starting at verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead, excuse me, to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them. But warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. 
Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equivalent, or excuse me, and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. I think one of the hardest things that we can do as parents, whether fathers or mothers, is to see a mistake that our children are making and allow them to make it. Samuel knew what the people were asking for. God certainly knew what the people were asking for and how it was going to turn out. But he let them have it anyhow. There are times that we need to allow them to find their own own way to make their own mistakes. Because the truth is, we make them too. So one of the things that um, I haven't mentioned about looking at God as a father, as an example of a good father, is the fact that there's something he can't teach us, that he can't role model for us. And that is how to handle mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. We do. There's a verse um, that I I like, sometimes don't like, depending on (laughs) how it's applied to me. Um, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse 7. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their fathers? If you were not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you were not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much, more show, how much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You'll notice that verse that says... They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. I think the implication is clear. We're doing our best, but we're not always right. God doesn't make mistakes. It says right there that, no, God, differently than human fathers, God disciplines us for our good. Not for what we think is good, to the best of our knowledge, for our good good, because he knows what is best for us. But we make mistakes as fathers. So how do we handle them? I honestly think, and this is something that I'm (laughs) learning far too late, I think how how we handle admitting our mistakes 
probably makes as much of a difference, as much of an influence as anything we do, particularly in our children's lives. I know, having talked to some of my kids, that realize that knowing the very fact that I'm not perfect, <laughs> that I make mistakes, and that I recognize that I make mistakes, probably does more influence on them than when I do everything right. <laughs> you know, that five minutes that I can, I can do everything right for. Um, <clears throat> It's funny, I hope this makes as much sense when I say it out loud as it did in my head. Even though God can't role model for us how to be fathers through our mistakes, admitting our mistakes and our faults probably is the most godly thing we can do. And the reason is this, because when we admit our mistakes, we recognize that we are fallible and that therefore we need a Savior. We're trying to teach our children to be able to lean on God, and that is a huge, huge responsibility and, and no more important. It, it doesn't matter if they get a good job or a lousy job or no job or whatever, but to be one of God's children to have given their lives over to Christ is the most important thing we can teach them as a father and we can't just give it to them we can't just do it for them as the old saying goes God doesn't have grandchildren everybody is either a son or a daughter of God or not we don't get to be in there because my dad is or my mom is or my grandparents were it's all between us and God and so we try to point this out for our children and the, the very thing that if, we, if we, don't, we don't recognize that we have mistakes, therefore we don't have any need. We're that self-sufficient person, that, that, that manly image that North America seems to have, or at least used to have. I'm an island. I don't need anybody. I can handle everything on my own. But that doesn't recognize the need for a Savior. It's when we can say, yes, I made mistakes. Yes, I screw up. But it's not the end of the story. That's when we can actually teach these important lessons to say, I'm disciplining you for your good as well as I know. Doesn't mean I'm always right. Doesn't even necessarily mean that I'm right half the time. But I'm trying. And I'm going to try to recognize and apologize for my mistakes when I make them. Because that puts us on a level playing field. That makes us the same in some way as our children because they make mistakes because they're learning, they're young. And me at 50, I'm still making mistakes, I'm still young. I'm still trying to be like my father. I played with this idea in my head too that Who here looks in the mirror these days and sees your dad? I know I do. You be quiet. <laughs> it seems like we become more and more, as men, like our fathers. Wouldn't it be wonderful that as we got older, we became more and more like our Heavenly Father? It's, it, it's funny that, it's funny like we have kids when we're young and we still don't know much and don't know that we don't know it. And then as we get older, when our children are leaving the house is when we start to get a little bit of wisdom at least to say, yeah, I really didn't have it together. But maybe it's just some sense in that. Maybe as we're starting to recognize that we didn't have it together, we're a little bit more ready to deal with our children that are going out in the world and going, Dad, how did you do this? How did you handle having a job and working all the time and gas costing so much and, and the kids and all these, how? 
and we can kind of look back and say, I really don't know. I just did the best I can. I really do think I really do think that one of the big problems that we have in society right now is a lack of proper fathers. A lack of proper men. We need to be able to find that balance of being that self-sufficient masculine man that can maybe take on challenges, but at the same time recognizing that sometimes you've got to be on your knees to ask God for help. That sometimes you're going to be the authoritarian, wait till dad gets home. Or wait till dad gets home and you see what happens then. And the, like a person that lifts a child to his cheek, teaching him to walk by taking their arms. There's got to be that balance. There's got to be a line there someplace where we can recognize that we are strong, but at the same time weak. But our Father can handle what we can't and help us to handle it. To recognize that we make mistakes and let our children know that we make mistakes by actually apologizing for them and not having that a sign of weakness but a sign of recognizing that we aren't sufficient on our own, but that we need God. That lesson, that recognizing that as strong as you may be, how many of you have heard this? If you ever got into fighting, I I didn't because I was always on the wrong end of things, but you always heard that, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you are, there's always somebody that's stronger or bigger. We can think we're going to be self-sufficient, but we're always going to have a need. Teach our children of that need and, and point them to the one that can actually give us that help. To not be such, so walled up that we don't need anybody, don't need anything, but to recognize it's not weakness, but it's brilliance to recognize that we need a Savior, need His help, need His love and His guidance. That's the kind of fathers we need to to be. It's the kind of fathers that I think society needs. And we're going to be, well, we already are under attack. We're going to need people you and me, to be able to spread the message, to recognize, to let people know that it's not a sign of weakness. To recognize that we need a Savior, that we are not self-sufficient. To also recognize that we can't just let anything go. That we have responsibilities to our families. That we can't just let our children go their own way without saying something, without trying to help. It's a tall order. And we need to do it through prayer because, like I said, we're not self-sufficient. We're, we're here to recognize our need for God and to help others to recognize that as well.